Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. Our Heavenly Father has instruction for us today. There are some guidance <clears throat> that he had provided through Sister White that go in line with what we have been studying over the last several Sabbaths, as well as what Theodore has been presenting regarding righteousness by faith. Shall we ask him for his blessing as we consider these words, as we consider these admonitions, and look to accept his guidance in all things? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these Sabbath hours. We thank you for the opportunity of being able to gather together, to be guided by you in the path that you would have us to walk. Help us now, Father, direct us in all things that you would have us to do. These admonitions are direct. There is little that we need to question, except as we hold on to other idols within our lives. Direct us now, Father. May your spirit be with us. May your angels attend us. Help us so that we may understand that which you would have us to do. I ask your blessing on each one that is here attending today, and for those that will attend later via the internet. Help us now, Father, that our hearts may be knit together, that we may come into a clearer understanding of all that you would have us to do. Help us now to this end. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Over the last several Sabbaths, we have been going over admonitions that Mrs. White had given to one particular family. Much of what is written here will have elements that have to do with that family, but we are going to look to return to that study in a following Sabbath. There will be much that we're going to need to consider. The document that is before you currently on the screen and the documents that will follow are part of three manuscripts that Mrs. White had written. Now, the title of this first one, What Shall a Man Give in Exchange for His Soul? Written from Sunnyside, Kurunbong, New South Wales, on the seventh day of the 10th month of 1899. As we have noted before, this document does have one or more typed copies that can be obtained only at the Ellen White estate. So they remain unpublished because these are documents that have additional handwritten notes. Let us see what Mrs. White has to say for us. The question was asked by Christ. What is a man profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 26. 
Man, man sells himself cheaply when he spends his life in securing worldly advantages. For in the ambition to secure earthly estate, business occupies the mind, and God is forgotten, and man reaps loss to all eternity. His money and lands cannot pay a ransom for his soul. Better, far better, are shattered hopes and the world's denunciation with the approval of God than to sit with princes and forfeit heaven. Christ declares you cannot serve God and mammon. Matthew 6.24. Addressing the churches through the disciple John, Christ said, <clears throat> He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. And the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. And of course, we recognize this very directly as being written to ourselves. We are to make diligent work for eternity. Those to whom the Lord has entrusted the talent of means, he expects to return to him their gifts and offerings. They are to act in behalf of Christ, representing the character of the great gift which God gave to save a sinful world. In entrusting means to human beings, he designs that they shall be not consumers, but producers. What admonition do we see here from the pen of inspiration? How are we to proceed when she has given so direct counsel to us at this time? To use our means for God's glory, not our own, not on some some silly, silly, frivolous thing. Okay. Christ bridged the gulf that sin had made, and thus he showed how highly he estimates the human race. He clothed his divinity with humanity, that humanity might take hold of divinity, and man become a partaker of the divine nature. And having done so much, he did not leave his work unfinished. He was known on earth as the friend of sinners. He mingled with all classes of society, that all may become acquainted with God manifest in the flesh. He did not shun the social life of his countrymen. At the very opening of his ministry, he attended a marriage feast in Cana, death and hell were conquered by his presence. He healed disease, rebuked injustice and oppression, and preached the gospel to the poor. In the wilderness of temptation, he met the enemy and conquered him with a thus saith the Lord. Get thee hence, Satan, he said. It is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Was Christ a social justice warrior? Not in the sense of that term these days, that's for sure. He was impartial, and his main goal was to uplift man so that he could become Christ-like. Did he turn to the left or to the right? No. 
most right now that we would see as social justice warriors have a very decided direction in which they are taking. And they are not taking the path that Christ would walk. Well, I grew up with that, um, my dad being, believing in what they call social justice. And it, it actually does damage uh, to the people that they're trying to help. Right. How great was this gift to man and how like our God to make it. With a liberality that can never be exceeded, he gave that he might save the rebellious sons of men and bring them to see the object and discern his life. Will you, by your princely offering, show that you think nothing too good to give to him who gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life? John 3.16 God has honored man in making him a laborer together with Christ. How often do we consider our trials to be an honor? How often do we praise God for the trials, the trials that we are that we must face day to day? Are we not to praise him in all things? Not just when things are good, but also when things seem to be so very dark. Yet how many are despising the message of mercy coming to them from God? There is nothing in all the world of so great consequence to Christ as his purchased possession, his church, his workers who go forth to scatter the seeds of truth looking forward to the harvest. None but Christ can measure the solicitude of his servants as they seek to save that which is lost. And he imparts his spirit as the self-sacrificing worker with earnest, untiring efforts, labor to win souls from sin to righteousness. A Paul may plant and Apollos water, for this is his work but it is God alone who can give the increase. <clears throat> when Christ's ambassadors present the gospel in its simplicity and the hearers respond to the word presented, nothing is so gratifying to the heart of infinite love than for these souls to come to him confessing their sins and giving expressing to their faith and to the truth for he delights to impart to them his righteousness when the question comes from the anxious soul what shall i do to be saved the answer returns believe on the lord jesus christ as your personal savior and thou shalt be saved for this, we are to see Acts 16, 30 and 31. Angels rejoice to see hearts open to receive the communication of light and love and pardon. When thanksgiving arises from human hearts because souls are receiving the impress of Christ, heavenly beings take up the song of praise. The prophet Zephaniah writes, in that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thine hand be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Zephaniah 3, 16 and 17. And will not the soul redeemed render to the sin-pardoning Savior his love and homage? Yes, verily. With the psalmist, he will sing, I have waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined into me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, 
and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. How else can we see this horrible pit and this miry clay? Where else do we see it? And how else shall we respond to it? And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud. And such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works that thou hast done and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee if I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Psalms 40, 1 to 5. The man who loves God will not only offer him lip service and praise and thanksgiving, but he will bring to the treasury his gifts and offerings that laborers may be sent forth to sow the precious seed. Will you show by your lives that you are seeking precious pearls? Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building, 1 Corinthians 3.9. God and man combine their efforts in this work. Christ calls his people to unity to bind themselves together in the bands of Christian fellowship. Let those who have named the name of Christ cease their criticism and bind up with one another and with Christ. Let them cherish feelings of tenderness and love and not think it a virtue to differ. God's workmen will have to guard jealously their own spirit, lest they allow Satan to come in and weaken them through disunion. Where there is union, there is strength. Let all your devising tend to bind you together, that you may be complete in Christ. What this says to me is when we seek to criticize, when we seek to be separated from brothers and sisters, when we seek our own way instead of that which God has put before us, we are turning our back upon what Christ would have done. Where there is union, there is strength. As we continue to study together, may it be said that we are coming into unity. May it be said that we are cherishing these feelings of tenderness and love. May we truly have the upper room experience to be prepared for the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Consider that this day. <clears throat> the word of God demands that we be one with Christ as he was one with the Father. That, says the apostle, ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, Matthew 5.45. The Lord is not pleased with variance and strife. And if his people will work intelligently and harmoniously, God will work with them and through them. But if they spend time and energy in striving for the supremacy, God will leave them in their weakness, for he will never work with unconsecrated elements. God calls for pure-spirited workers. We cannot, as W.W. W. Prescott sought to do, set aside prophecy. We cannot 
as others would like to do, set aside the numbers, the chronology of that which God has put before us. For who is it that is speaking to us, that is giving us this prophecy and this chronology? Who is Palmoni? Well, we know it is Christ. Is it not Christ alone? Christ, our Savior? Christ, our Advocate? Christ, our Judge? Christ, our King? If God is calling for pure spirited workers, then what is Christ calling for? <clears throat> if we seek to be separated from others, would we not be left alone? in weakness. Is this not a fearful proclamation? The new commandment I give unto you, Christ says, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love one, have love for one another. John 13, 34 and 35. As the Father hath loved me, so I have loved you. Continue in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. John 15, 9 to 12. The enemy of souls will put forth every effort to hinder this work in the heart. Where is this work being done? In the heart. He will seek to place the mark of division and strife upon God's people. When there are those that would seek to divide, when there are those that would seek to separate, to cast out, whose work are they doing? This enemy, accusers. excuse me, the accusers, exactly. So do you wish to stand with the accuser? Do any of us wish to stand with the accuser? I'd have to say no. Anybody else? Absolutely not. This enemy is to be steadfastly resisted by every individual soul. We inquire of those who claim to be followers of Christ. Will you resist the devil that he may not weaken and destroy God's heritage? Or will you unite with the enemy of righteousness to do his work and to dishonor God? This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 John 5, 4. <clears throat> Christ's prayer to his followers 
for his followers was the glory which thou gavest me i have given them that they may be one even as we are one i in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one and that they would may believe that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me father i will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold thy glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them my name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. John 17, 22 to 26. When God's people work together harmoniously and intelligently, Christ's request to the Father for them will be fulfilled. Did Christ not, in his prayer, declare that his father was righteous? Well, well yes. <clears throat> Can we then see in this paragraph an element of what it means to become righteous by faith? Amen. He says he's declared unto us his, his name, his father's name. So that's the character. You know, he expresses the character of God by word and deed. And that's what we need to be partaking of. This last sentence. When God's people work together harmoniously and intelligently, Christ's request to the father for them will be fulfilled. Does this not give us another element of righteousness by faith? Amen. Now, the second manuscript. The yoke of restraint and obedience. Both of these manuscripts are listed by the White Estate as being non-published, where only portions had been given. Here again, this manuscript was written two days later, October 9th, the ninth day of the 10th month of 1899. And again, there are portions that are not published. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. Christ's yoke is a yoke of restraint and obedience. We owe full and complete obedience to our Lord, for we are his by creation and by redemption. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here again, she repeats John 3.16. Was the life of Samson ordered according to the pattern of restraint and obedience? As a Nazarite, 
one that was not to drink wine or strong drink, that was not to eat of the unclean, that was to live according to God's law. Was this restraint a difficult thing? Was his obedience to be complete? In this situation, was this a hard task? <laughs> Bless you. Sorry. No problem. This yoke of restraint and obedience is not as difficult as that of disobedience to the law of God. Amen. The way of the transgressors. We are to bear the yoke of Christ <clears throat> that we may be placed in complete union with him. Can we be placed in an incomplete union with Christ? Can a true servant be at odds in any manner or any way with his master? The servant. Take my yoke upon you, he says, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. When God's requirements are in direct opposition to the will and purposes of the human agent, what is to be done? Hear what God says. If any man come after me and will deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, Matthew 16, 24. The yoke and the cross are symbols which represent the same thing, the giving up of the will to God. Wearing the yoke unites finite man in companionship with the dearly beloved son of God. We cannot follow Christ without lifting the cross and bearing it after him. If our will is not in accordance with the divine requirements, we are to deny our inclinations, give up our darling desires, and step in Christ's footprints. <clears throat> Consider now what that means to you this day the lord does not encourage the wisest the most cherished plans of human beings if he sees that they are not for the healthfulness of the spirituality of his cause sometime the lord's purposes come in direct opposition with the plans in which the human agent finds himself excuse me Sometimes the Lord's purposes come in direct opposition with plans in which the human agent himself cannot see a flaw. Then it is that the right hand must be sacrificed and the right eye taken out. Purposes which seem in every way desirable must be given up. The Lord sees that for the spiritual health of the human agent, and for the future well-being of his cause, all self-confidence must be cut away. Human wisdom and self-sufficiency must be broken down. <clears throat> Here again, human wisdom and self-sufficiency must be broken down. Oh, these things are too hard for us to understand. Oh, these things are too difficult. You're too condescending. We don't need you. We are doing well on our own. This is not in accordance with God's teachings. Just carry us to the mountaintop, and that's good enough. Right. 
The Lord never makes a false estimate concerning his heritage. He measures the men with whom he is working. When they submit to Christ's yoke, when they give up the struggle, which has not been profitable for themselves or for the cause of God, they will find peace and rest. Men frame for their own necks yokes, which seem light and pleasant to wear, but which will prove galling in the extreme. Men do not see this, but Christ sees it as it is, and he says, take my yoke upon you. The yoke you would place on your own neck, thinking it a precise fit, will not fit at all. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me the lessons essential for you to learn. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty nine and 30. He that will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Mark 8, 34. Lifting this cross cuts away self from the soul and places the human agent where he can learn how to wear Christ's yoke and to bear his burdens. When men and women become sensible to their own weakness, their def own deficiencies, they will delight to do God's will. They will submit to the yoke of Christ. Then God can work in them to will and to do of his own good pleasure, which is often entirely contrary to the plans of the human mind. When the heavenly anointing comes to us, we shall learn the lessons of meekness and lowliness, which always brings rest to the soul. What does that say to us today? Well, one of the things that, um, that always strikes me uh, is this idea that, that um, um, what's the words here? Um, the denial of self. I just can't. Oh, well, yeah. Him, him that will come after me, let him deny himself. And I don't think we understand fully what that means. That is to understand our, our weakness and our deficiencies. Because what we're actually, God's asking us to deny is something that is completely weak, completely deficient. He's not asking us to deny something good. He's asking us to deny something that's weak and deficient, something that's bad. Something that's corrupt. Yeah. And yet we still hold on to ourselves, even though it's something that's, that's been damaged. So to yield that up to Christ, to ask him to take over our life, is the only logical and sensible thing to do. It makes no sense to hold on to. Uh, something that's damaged and corrupt. In this, I think we can we can see that this presents another element of righteousness by faith. I don't even know if I'd call it another element. I mean, I, I mean, in a sense, it is. But this is almost the root of righteousness by faith. It is the first step to be able to see the first step that we have a part in is that part to actually recognize um, our, our situation. Because without that, we can't, we can't have righteousness by faith. And I know there's all these different steps, but this has to be constant. It's not a step that we get over and we never, we never have to come to again. It's something that we come to every day. And it's something that the 144,000 have every second. We are dealing with a need very much like Father Miller did within his dream. 
when we consider that not only in William Miller's dream do we see that this curiously wrought casket that contained gold and jewels that were scattered is a representation of <clears throat> scripture and the spirit of prophecy. It is also a representation of the message that we are to give of righteousness by faith. Because since 1888, <clears throat> the message of righteousness by faith has been obscured with all sorts of shavings, dirt, and dust. We do not see it as clearly as we should. When I speak of this as being elements of righteousness by faith, it is so that we can then begin in our own minds, clearing away the misconceptions that have been placed upon this since 1888. Yeah, the interesting thing is how all of this rubbish gets removed through prophecy. And if you think about it, William Miller's message was a prophetic message. Very definitely. I mean, he's, he didn't deal with the doctrines of scripture. That wasn't his, he wasn't doing systematic theology. No. He was presenting the prophecies of the Bible and allowing the Holy Spirit to work upon people's hearts. And it wrought a change in people when they received that light. And, and yet we think that the message of righteousness by faith is somehow detached from prophecy. And especially hand in hand. And especially with the, the chronological aspects of it. So, you know, when I've seen that people have reacted negatively to the chronology and yet have made a case that we need to be presenting the third angel's message. I mean, this is the thing that Jeff kept running into all the time, as I've said before. And yet he was doing the work that Miller did. Amen. And, and why would we as Seventh-day Adventists reject that foundational work? Because the central pillar and foundation of Adventism isn't just the sanctuary. It's the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days. Without the 2300 days, you don't have the sanctuary. Without prophecy, you cannot have the work that is shown in the sanctuary. It can't be. How, how else can we point the way through the sanctuary? How much better can we show the steps through the sanctuary? Now, it, you know, it's kind of interesting because because um, you mentioned that. I mean, people send me uh, materials all the time. And I've had a number of people send me uh, charts or they've drawn charts and put them on WhatsApp of the work through the sanctuary. And we, we've done this ourselves when we were studying Ezekiel. And as I've thought about it, I realized that um, in some ways that's ineffectual. That is to see the steps on a chart is one thing, but to actually recognize that we're passing through these steps prophetically is another. And to be participating in that process. So this work of the sanctuary is something that that has to be experienced prophetically. It happens, on, it happens on an individual basis, but it also happens on a prophetic level throughout the world, throughout salvation history. Isn't it interesting 
that how the chronology supports the prophecy. and are proceeding together. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of bothered me, you know, ever since I've been in this movement, but specifically once we started to make predictions about the future in that I wondered why God was doing this. And, you know, to me, it seemed a bit, um, for lack of a better word, overkill. Um, all of the things that we have been finding, I mean, they just keep piling on top of one another. And, and how personal these things can become for each one of us to see our part in this prophetic uh, vision. And, and I'm still not fully um, at ease with it. And that is, you know, I feel how can it possibly be? How can, how can we be involved in something so profound as what we see happening in this movement? But I've come to realize that it must be that way. Otherwise, there is no way uh, this work on earth could be finished unless man participates in prophecy. And God is just showing us um, how close he is, how valuable each of us are as individuals, and how close he is to each one of us. So he, is, he has come so close. God is not far away. And, and every person on earth who is seeking God will find the same evidences that God is leading, and they will go through the same, for lack of a better word, process they're going to go through that experience of salvation that's being discussed here in the spirit of prophecy. Now, <clears throat> I am not setting aside what Theodore has just said. But to answer some of what, what he was speaking about comes up in the next two paragraphs. God brings all into trying positions to see if they will trust in a power out of and above themselves. Is this saying that God brings only a select few into trying positions? Is this saying that he is bringing only chosen vessels into trying positions? Is this saying that he is bringing only ministers and leaders of the church into trying positions? Keywords all. What does all mean to you? Everyone. Does it mean yourself? Yes. He sees not as man sees. He often has to break up human connections and change the order which man has mapped out, which is perfect in man's estimation. What man things thinks are for his spiritual and temporal interests may be altogether at variance with the experience he must have in order to be a follower of Christ. His idea of his own value may be far out of the way. Yeah, I want to comment on this just from my own personal experience. Um, anybody who knows me knows that I'm... Um, very frugal. Um, when I started the guitar store, for instance, I started with nothing. But one of the, the keys that I had to being successful is I like to live with very little overhead. Now, this, of course, you know, can be seen as a good thing. It's, I mean, it's a sensible thing to do. 
But in some ways, for me, it's a way of me not trusting in God. In that um, presently I'm put in a situation where I have more overhead than I've ever had on a personal level. And it's not something I like because I can't see the end of it. You know, if you, if you have nothing, you have nothing to lose, right? Right. That's always been my philosophy. Um, but God has put me in a situation where I know that he's leading, but he's leading in a way that I wouldn't naturally go. And, and for me, it's an extremely trying situation. It exercises my faith and trust in God's leading. And, and this line here where he often has to break up human connections and change the order which man has mapped out. Uh, I mean, this is what God always has done. Any plan that we have had, any plan that I've had, has never worked out the way that I expected. It's always worked out I can't say necessarily better in the sense of how I would have seen things, but ultimately it has worked out for his purpose rather than for my own purpose. Amen. And, and so when we look at what, what man thinks are for his spiritual and temporal interests may be altogether at variance with the experience he must have in order to be a follower of Christ. And, and the one thing that the one thing that bothers me in, in my present choices that I made to where I live is that people may um, think that I have different motives than I have. That is, I'm kind of embarrassed living in a nicer place. I don't know if that makes sense to people. But it, it's a little funny. I mean, but well, yes, I get it. Well, yeah, sense, I feel. I go through that. Well, in a sense, I t I I take pride in my simplicity, and this is something that's really struck me over the last month. Um, and and so I'm kind of embarrassed, actually, living in a nice place. So. Uh, so, you know, but this is what I see is that God has for us a purpose and that we have our, our plans, our pride, our way we think that God wants us to go. And God has a different plan for us because he sees something that we don't see because man sees not as, or God sees not as man sees. And so I've had to trust that God must know what he's doing because I sure don't know. It becomes interesting when we have to trust that way mm -hmm. because that's not our natural mindset. Yeah. See, you know, a lot of people would like to win the lottery because then they don't have to worry and trust in God, right? I mean, a lot of people would like to have lots of money because if I had lots of money, then I wouldn't have to trust in God. But my, my, my way has, has been the one that appears on the surface to be more noble. I just have nothing. So I don't need to really worry about losing anything. But yeah, it's, it's just, for me, it's, it's, been, it's really struck me hard. I, I, I don't know if it makes sense to anyone else. But to me, it, it's been extremely difficult making this choice. But I can't deny God's leading. And one thing I know about God's leading is that it always goes contrary to our nature. Exactly. That's been my experience. Okay. Tests are placed all along the way from earth to heaven. Unless this was so, the road to heaven would not be called the narrow way. Character must be tested, else there would be many spurious Christians who would keep up a fair semblance of religion until their inclination, their desire to have their own way, their pride and ambition 
was crossed. When by the Lord's permission, sharp trials come to them, their lack of genuine religion, of the meekness and lowliness of Christ, shows them to be in need of the work of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> We are told to praise him in all things. We are told that the tests are given to those to see if they will indeed walk with Christ. When we look to have our own way, when our pride is being crossed when we are walking according to our own inclinations we are not walking according to that which christ would have done abraham believed god and delighted to obey him when he was commanded to offer up his only son as a sacrifice, he could not reason out the command. He stopped reasoning and obeyed. Is it not said that Abraham walked by faith? Yes. Is he not our example of one that was righteous through his faith? Absolutely. He stopped reasoning and obeyed. How many can this be said of today? No one could have been more severely tested. God desired to give Abraham a lesson that would be for his present and eternal good. How old was he when this lesson came upon him? Wasn't he uh, 80, uh, 86? Or... When Abraham was commanded to give his only son as a sacrifice, Abraham was 120 and his son was 20. Oh, that's right. Okay. In this situation, could Isaac have overpowered Abraham? Pretty easily. Yet father and son were united in trusting God. Abraham obeyed the command and came off conqueror. God's people today will be tested and tried. The Lord will put his purposes in the place of their devising. This will often be contrary to human desires and inclinations, contrary to the doc dictates of the flesh. God has been testing us since July 18th. Are we willing to give a message that is going to look to be foolishness to the world. Did Noah give a message that was judged to be foolishness to the world? Did Abraham follow God's instruction even though he understood God would not require human sacrifice. What was being cut away? What was being decided? When this message of July 18th was given, when it came to the movement, God was providing a test. He was providing a test to see who is going to present this and who is going 
to state that this was not of God? Um, you know, when that, that whole event was going on, I was standing right there saying, yeah, we need to do this. Um, and it was mostly uh, through my conscience. Um, and what I mean by that is it was, it, it was the security of the people in Nashville were my concern as far as, I mean, I've heard people make predictions and stuff and I knew, you know, the risks of what was, we were doing when we were going into it, because I knew that um, we were actually destined for um, a disappointment. But even all that stuff in, I mean, you know, it, 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 was, it was a challenge to be able to actually uh, uh, agree with all that stuff um, that was going on then. Um, in clear, I mean, I, which was really a fight, a struggle inside of me. It, you know, uh, I didn't want to do it, but I knew I had to. You, you know what I'm saying? I do. I, I, I really, I really didn't want to do it, but I knew I had to. I had been convinced through scriptures that that was the right choice. And, and we also and we also knew that the movement was was making this prediction. Yeah, it, it wasn't one person. It was something that a, a series of events that had transpired during this awakening, we'll call it, yeah. um, that all this stuff transpired. Yes. Yeah. So to me, it, it, it I felt that this whole thing was was through God's will, and uh, it was not what I was expecting. Mm -hmm. Well, for me personally, it was it was difficult because the one thing I, ever, I never want to do is deceive someone. Right. And so it, it was a lot of pressure on me, you know, personally. But, but I recognized, I mean, one is God, the proclamation would go forth. So I left it in God's hands. You know, when, when FFA shut down the July 18, 2020 prediction uh, in 2018, and, and when I was forbidden by TABO to, to present it uh, in early 2019, I accepted that. But it doesn't mean, mean that I didn't believe it was, was true. I knew it was from God, but it was also in God's hands. And so when FFA took up, when Jeff took up, the proclamation of July 18, 2020. Um, I mean, you could see it was obviously God. So there's no way that I could have imagined that this was somehow uh, an error. But I also knew that it could fail. And Jeff knew that too. I mean, he, he had that door open because of what he presented. I mean, the story of Jonah, the story of Abraham offering up Isaac that we're studying here is is one of the things that Jeff compared it to. And so he knew that we were being asked to do something that went against what we understood to be true. We don't sacrifice humans, but God says sacrifice a human. We don't time set, but God says time set. And Parminder's argument and Tess's argument for time setting was the wrong one because they said, well, what Ellen White said there doesn't count because it's a different dispensation. But that's not the argument here with Abraham, right? Right. And that wasn't the argument Jeff used. He used this Abraham argument. Because this was God asking us to do something that would make us look foolish in the eyes of others if it didn't happen. Who do we trust? Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, we do trust that God was leading us. So that is righteousness by faith. Exactly. Right. And yet people who profess to believe righteousness by faith reject July 18th. Hands down. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
in many ways. But here again, we have three examples because in scripture, we are told that no one knoweth the day or the hour except the Father. Right? right. Yet, William Miller and those that followed him, his 300, proclaimed the message of Christ's return for October 22nd, 1844. Yeah, and, and they had all of these scriptures saying that we can't know the, the time of Christ's coming until the Father makes it known. Right. Right, because, it, you know, no man knoweth the day or the hour, but the Father makes known the day or the hour. Now, we know that that's after the special resurrection that the Father makes that day and hour known. So there, there comes a time when he's going to make it known. But yet, people would criticize what we're doing and be Seventh-day Adventists. And, and they'd say, well, the 2300 days, that was fine. But really, Miller went as much against what the scriptures say in regard to the second coming as this movement did. Because we're not even, we didn't even predict the second coming. We knew that we were predicting something that was internal within this movement. But even then, we can't predict the events. Uh, even though God gives us these lines, there is no event that we can predict the day or the hour. We can, we can measure the time, we can see how God leads, but we have to move through those steps, walking with Christ day by day, exercising that faith and trust that God knows what's happening, that he knows what's coming, and that he is preparing us for those moments uh, where that test is going to be manifested. Right. It just gives us the light. Uh in enough quantity to where we can see where we're walking. Not, not so much that where we're going, other than the other light at the other end. Just enough for your feet. I, I don't know how many just enough, just enough for your feet. backpacking in the mountains in the dark and all you have is, have is a headlamp on. I mean, you definitely can't see what's ahead of you except a few feet. And yet you have to walk this path by faith, knowing that the light that you have is sufficient to get to the end. Right. Christ's words. He that will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Christ's words applied to that of William Miller. Christ's words applied to us regarding July 18th. Christ's words apply to us today regarding unity. Christ's words that he will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, is the touchstone which discovers the quality of man's experience. When a man's inclinations or ambitious hopes are crossed, he reveals the spirit that governs him. The Lord permits trials to come to his people. And the only way to do with these trials is to take them all to Jesus. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. The cross of self-denial and self-sacrifice stands directly in our way. If we separate from Christ, we shall rebel because we are called upon to lift this cross. We shall fret. We shall complain, manifesting traits of character which show that there is a need of crucifixion of the will before God can work in us. Consider that carefully. Christ declares that the only course for men and women to pursue is for their present and eternal good is to comply with his invitation. 
he, the majesty of heaven, disrobed himself of his glory and clothed his divinity with humanity, that he might pass through what humanity must pass through. Christ invites all to take his yoke and to learn his meekness and lowliness. He knows that it is positively necessary for them to do this, but no human being can wear the yoke of submission and obedience who does not learn daily in the school of Christ. Whatever may be a person's supposed amiability, however qualified for usefulness he may appear to be, however righteous he may be apparently, he cannot work for God unless he learns of Christ. No one, whatever may be his supposed abilities, can bear the test of trial unless he is a student in the school of Christ. Our Savior purchased the human race by humiliation of the very severest kind. He submitted to mockery, abuse, scorn, and to a cruel, shameful death to make it possible for man to be saved. He points us to the only path that will lead to the straight gate opening into the narrow way, beyond which lie broad and pleasant pastures. He has marked out every step of the way and that no one may make a mistake. He tells us just what to do. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the only way in which sinners can be saved. We must take upon ourselves the yoke of Christ in order to be saved. Yeah, I remember back uh, when I was first in Adventist and we just had the three blue indexes. Okay. In writings. And I'd looked up this verse and I can't remember how many pages uh, there were, uh, but it was a great number of pages. And this to me, it was always one of my favorite passages. Um, but to take up the yoke of Christ or to learn in the school of Christ, I think we hardly know what that what that means. Um, I'm just looking up here, the school of Christ. Um, so she has 913 references to the school of Christ in her writings, which is a lot. Um, yet it's, it's something that I think we really don't understand what that means to take up his yoke, because the yoke is a yoke of obedience. Right? Isn't that the Ten Commandments? In this case, is that not what is being asked of us? Is that not righteousness by faith? Yeah. And to find this rest because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And yet this is the only way that sinners can be saved. There is, there is no other way. Knowing that no human being can do this in his own strength, Christ tells us not to be worried or afraid, but to remember what he can do if we come to him trusting not in our human weakness, but in his strength. He said, if you yoke up with me, your redeemer, I will be your strength and your efficiency. The blessings connected with Christ's invitation can only be realized and enjoyed by those who wear Christ's yoke. The invitation that Christ has given cannot be realized and cannot be enjoyed by those that refuse to wear Christ's yoke. 
so what's the what's the symbology of the yoke exactly? I mean, I have my idea of it. it doesn't doesn't that mean um, restraint? Very much. I mean, that's that's the bottom line of, as to what that device actually is. It's a, well, it's a restraining mechanism. Well, if you have two two oxen and you're going to yoke them to um, one could be stronger than the other, but the yoke evens out that um, um, the, the load. Yeah, the load, right? So in taking up uh, this yoke with Christ, I mean, we're, we're the weaker. Mm -hmm. um, so God, Christ is giving us his strength because he says the yoke is easy and his burden is light. For him, it's not a difficult task, but for us, we could never do it alone. I recall what Sister White was saying about um, having to build your strength up physically. You also need to do that spiritually. I mean, that's, I don't remember her saying that actually, but um, in that context, but that's the way I read that whole thing. We're going to have, we have to build ourselves up to a certain level of strength. And um, the only way to do it is to, to train. And I, I, these are all these things that go on in our lives are just, just training exercises. Accepting his invitation, you withdraw your sympathy, your affections from the world and place them where you can realize the blessing of close fellowship and communion with God. By coming to Christ, your interests are bound up with his. Those that refuse the yoke of Christ have their interests elsewhere. Consider that. The Lord has determined that every soul who obeys his word shall have his joy, his peace, his continual keeping power. Such men and women are brought near to him always, not only when they kneel before him in prayer, but also when they take up the duties of life. He has prepared for them an abiding dwelling place with himself, where the life is purified from all grossness, all unloveliness. By this unbroken communion with him, they are made co-laborers with him in their daily work. Christ says, without me, you can do nothing, John 15, 5. As we advance step by step in the path of obedience, we shall know how true is the promise that they who follow on to know the Lord shall know that he is going forth is prepared as the morning. Clearer light is ready to shine upon all who follow him, who is the light of the world. Clearer light is being given by Palmoni. And who is that? The wonderful numberer. That would be Christ. That's it's one of his many names. But Palmoni, the wonderful numberer, does mean that numbers are also important. Absolutely. Everyone who takes upon him the yoke of Christ with full determination to obey every word of God will have a healthful, symmetrical experience. He will enjoy the blessings which come to him as a result of his life being hid with Christ in God. Did Samson enjoy the blessings which come and are, were available for him as a result of his life being hid with Christ in God? Not such a great example, but the situation with Samson 
he was presented with the restraint that would come upon the Nazarite. And as long as he accepted the restraint, God's strength would be with him. Samson chose not to accept the restraint and regretted it and came to understand why it was so important. In business life, he will work out the principles laid down in Christ's Sermon on the Mount. He will renounce the bag of deceitful weights and will despise the fraud of tricks in trade. He will earn money not to hoard it, but to put it in circulation. He has an abiding sense that he is part of the heavenly firm and that it is his duty to trade the talents given him by God. He realizes that he is adopted into the family of God and that he must act toward all as Christ acted when he was upon the earth. Well, now I know why I'm always broke. Okay. That's just a joke. That's just a joke. What a diligent, constant work is the work of the true Christian. Ever he wears the yoke of Christ. Evil surmisings are not allowed to take root in his heart. He has genuine modesty and does not talk of his own accomplishments and qualifications. Self-admiration is not a part of his experience. There is much to learn in regard to what comprises true Christian character. It certainly is not self-inflation. The true Christian keeps his eyes fixed on him who searches the heart and trieth the reins, who requires truth in the inward parts. His constant prayer is, search me, O Lord, and let me know my heart. Try me and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Compliments are not to be given to sinful, erring men. We must accept this without reservation. The glory and the majesty of God should ever fill our souls with a holy awe, humbling us in the dust before him. What is the message of righteousness by faith? It is the humbling the glory of man into the dust. Compliments are not to be given to the sinful vessels. Our glory is to be laid into the dust. His condescension, his wide, deep compassion, his tenderness and love are given us to strengthen our confidence and remove that fear that tendeth unto bondage. The Lord wants us to give him all there is of us in steady, evenly balanced Christian life, which illustrates the principles of his law. Let us not endure the thought of being religious dwarfs. This is not, as some would say, a politically correct comment. So be it. If we are choosing to be enfeebled, if we are choosing to be religiously crippled, are we serving Christ? Are we choosing to be yoked up with him? That is the question that I put before you this day. That is the consideration that I offer for you at this time. Let us not endure the thought of being religious 
dwarfs. Our time is coming to a close. Does any have any other comments or thoughts regarding that which Sister White has written for us today? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we see our great need of you. We are not struggling with sin. We are accepting sin. Therefore, how can we become righteous by faith if we choose not to struggle against our own inclinations? Direct us this day. Show us that that you would have of us. Help us that we will not stand enfeebled, that we will not stand crippled, that we will not stand as religious dwarfs, but that we may grow and come into the character that you would have us to come into, that we may stand as those of your creation, not of our own estimation. Guide us now, direct us through this day. We thank you for the Sabbath, for the time that we have with you and to be guided by you. May your will be done for each of us. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.